Thank you, Yana, for the instructions. We have our amazing interpreters with us, uh, Yana and Anastasia. Thank you very much. All right. So I start recording, and I think we can start with the first presentation. Greetings, dear colleagues. I'm happy to see you all on our regular meeting. And our today's uh, speaker is Mykola Homaniuk. Uh, he is a representative of uh, the first uh, residential program uh, of uh, the uh, Indiana University. He is uh, from uh, Harrison uh, State University Department of uh, Ecology, and he is uh, covering a broad number of uh, topics, including the policy of uh, memories, ethnical studies, sociology. And today he will tell us about the mechanisms of uh, the uh, use of the political advertisement in occupied territories. And he will tell, tell us about inconvenient present, the story of uh, political advertising in occupied Kherson. Greetings, everyone. I will start sharing my screen now. Those of you who are from Ukraine are well aware about uh, the situation, but uh, those of you who do not know that Ukraine is a country of uh, billboards. We have uh, a lot of outdoor advertising compared to, to the European countries and uh, the United States of America. During the occupation, these billboards uh, that uh, used to, to have uh, the advertisements uh, on some um, clothes or um, food uh, became um, just uh, some pieces of paper and uh, the reminder of uh, former life. The occupation lasted for seven months, and I have been there in the city of Kherson during that, that time, and I was collecting information during that time. And it was uh, very easy to notice that uh, where those billboards uh, used to be, we see we were able to see a completely different type of uh, advertisement. Uh, the Red Army, uh, the Soviet uh, past, uh, the Russian um, culture icons, uh, and uh, later on they were followed uh, by um, people wearing Ukrainian embroidery shirts, uh, but uh, also uh, holding uh, Russian passports in their hands. Starting from uh, May 2022, Russian occupiers uh, were using actively outdoor advertising. They were using billboards and posters in order to propagate their narratives. I was um, researching uh, this campaign from the point of view of electoral campaign that resulted in referendum. The referendum on uh, uh, the accession of uh, the Kherson region and incorporating the Kherson region into the Russian Federation. I would like to ask you to uh, turn off uh, your microphones. So today, I suggest uh, we uh, look into the advertising in uh, the occupied territories, and we will view this from the prism of uh, the of, uh, the current event. Given the number of uh, billboards, uh, the campaign was uh, very fruitful in, the, in those seven months of the occupation. The thing is uh, that the occupiers were not able to take uh, our control in uh, media environment. 
since most of the citizens uh, were uh, we're getting their information uh, from uh, telegram channels and uh, viber groups and uh, they were mostly reading uh, ukrainian media outlets and pro-ukrainian channels uh, in social media therefore the occupiers were not able uh, to take uh, control over digital uh, media and social networks uh, therefore the advertisement uh, outdoors uh, was the only way for them uh, to uh, propagate uh, their narratives. The first billboards uh, appeared in the streets of Kherson on the eve of the Victory Day. It was not a systematic effort. There was a series of uh, billboards dedicated to, to the celebration of the Victory Day, pro-Russian style. These billboards looked like the postcards uh, that were inherited uh, from the Soviet times. These billboards uh, contained a number of uh, typical uh, symbols uh, like uh, the uh, Soviet star, the uh, military insignia, uh, the coat of arms of the Soviet Union. And after the victory day, after the 9th of May, more billboards were posted on the streets of Kherson. New narratives appeared, and they were related to, to their referendum. They appeared at the end of May. And this uh, set of uh, billboards was called uh, Kherson, the city with Russian history. These billboards uh, were about, were holding the portraits of uh, the Russian historic figures who were somehow related to her son. Uh, for instance, uh, Field Marshal Suvorov, Field Marshal Potemkin, General Denis Davidov, uh, figure from the 19th century. Culture icons uh, like uh, Pushkin, uh, like uh, Afanasy Fet, Soviet writer. Boris Garbatov, uh, the uh, war reporter, who uh, produces the Bandarchuk. And this series of billboards contained a lot of text. Just take a look at uh, this photo. This is the billboard with Denis Davidov, and it contains over 80 words. The marketing specialist will tell you that the billboard should not contain more than 10 words on its surface. Six to seven words is the best recommendation. These billboards uh, were not the billboards per se. They were used uh, more like uh, the bulletin boards and announcements on this bulletin board. I have analyzed these texts, and these texts uh, mostly originate uh, from popular websites uh, like Wikipedia, and they were simply copy-pasting this text. Some of this text uh, we're referring uh, to the time of uh, Catherine II, the Russian Empress. And uh, they were featuring uh, the Russian military figures uh, wearing uh, their military awards. And I think that I should bring up uh, the issue of uh, decolonization, as sometimes we hear the arguments against the removal of uh, the 
uh, Russian related uh, names uh, from the streets or uh, dismantling the monuments. But it is used for propaganda when it remains. For instance, Afanasy Fet. Uh, he is uh, related to, to the fortress uh, located in uh, Novogiorgiysk, uh, but it is uh, part of a Kirovograd region now. And it takes uh, some effort uh, to find this information and to ask uh, the local history experts. Another series of uh, billboards uh, was repeating uh, the narrative uh, from the previous series. Uh, some events uh, from the Soviet Union and also from uh, the uh, Russian Empire times. You see uh, Catherine the second, and uh, you see some of the figures uh, of importance to the Russian Empire. For instance, uh, Kherson as uh, the capital city of uh, the province. Uh, you see that uh, here you, it says, uh, uh, my city is Kherson uh, by Ushakov, also, although he never said that. And you see that some of them were dedicated to Soviet troops. At the same time, new type of uh, billboards appeared with completely different messages. And this is the third series of uh, billboards uh, that uh, were posted on the, in the month of July 2022. Mostly um, these billboards contained uh, the quote uh, from uh, the Putin's article, uh, Ukrainians and Russians are the same nation, are the two parts of one whole. And these billboards were actually were also containing images of uh, Ukrainian citizens uh, wearing uh, Ukrainian embroidery shorts. There were three billboards of this kind. And uh, there was another billboard uh, with a uh, uh, frigate. Actually, this series, uh, Kherson uh, Forever with Russia, you see that uh, this photo is actually the photo by Hanna Pasichnik. Um, she's a Ukrainian photographer who posted her photos on a pho photo stock uh, website. And uh, those photos were used for propaganda in Kherson. You see, these photos are also by Hanna Pasichnik. It says, Russia is here to stay. So what do we see here? On one hand, when we see people wearing Ukrainian embroidered shirts, uh, they are supposed to cause uh, some contradictory feelings. Uh, as uh, it looks like uh, the uh, reference do, to denazification uh, as uh, the objective of this special military operation. And on the other hand, uh, these embroidery shirts and uh, wheat uh, fields uh, fit well into the uh, Russian uh, local history studies, uh, the small Russia, as Ukraine was referred to. And uh, all these um, patriotic uh, series were basically neutralized uh, by uh, the uh, Russian flag, uh, its colors, and uh, two-headed eagle, double-headed eagle. Another series is dedicated to our priorities. These posters also contained uh, the logo of uh, the uh, Russian party, and uh, it was about the referendum. A forum was held in uh, Kherson, and uh, the declaration of uh, the Russian Kherson uh, was uh, passed uh, over there. The first step towards the referendum. This series is uh, 
also reminding uh, the local history. You see that uh, all people on uh, these billboards are wearing uh, traditional Ukrainian embroidery. And you see that uh, it contained also parts of political advertising for the future, some promises for the future. For instance, Russian passport, the decent life, although there was no explanation of what it actually means. Or, for instance, promises uh, of uh, affordable housing for the families, for young families. Uh, those of you who know what uh, advertisement is about in Russia, actually, it is similar. This is the billboard about social welfare and uh, security. Another series of um, billboards you know, was referring to the past. Here's people of Kherson are the pride of Russia, featuring Wonder 2 was born in Kherson region, although Vanderchuk's uh, biography contains uh, um, the information about uh, uh, him uh, getting uh, um, the award from, uh, from the American Academy. He won Oscar, but uh, Russian propaganda redacted this information and uh, the Stalin word was mentioned. Evgeny Matveyev also originates uh, from Kherson. He is an actor and uh, he was playing the role of Leonid Brezhnev. And uh, he actually had, there was a monument uh, to him uh, even in the city. And you see that over here, uh, there is the monument uh, and uh, the ceremonial portrait of uh, Grigory Potemkin. And another message is, her son is Russia. And you see uh, Alexander Suvorov. This is uh, um, the series uh, with the Russian heroes. You see Admiral Fyodor Ushakov, and you see the background, uh, the uh, Russian naval fleet. Apart uh, from the series of uh, billboards, they were standalone billboards uh, that were dedicated to, to certain events, uh, for instance, the Day of Russia. And this one that you can see on the slide is my favorite. It is about the ordinary citizens of Kherson the uh, people of uh, Pernistrovia, the people of uh, Donbass, and the people of Kherson, the narrative that resembles the narratives of unrecognized people's republic. And you see that on one hand, that this is the advertisement of the emergency services, and the text says that uh, the emergency services of Russia and Ukraine are the saviors of uh, the citizens. But you see that uh, these saviors, uh, these defenders, do not have uh, any names. And uh, you see that uh, they are uh, covering their faces. They are wearing glasses. Uh, they are um, you know, wearing, for instance, a diving suit. And you are not even sure who that person is. And actually, there is the reason for that. They are anonymous. Uh, and there was the reason for that. And the last series of the billboards uh, that were posted basically on the first day of the referendum on the 20th of September and on the 22nd they started putting it up and the main motto is that we are together with Russia that her son is together with Russia it is a series of billboards uh, and uh, there was also a billboard near the city hall at the uh, Liberty Square. Well, the picture quality is not that good because I was scared of uh, taking a picture from up close because you see there was a checkpoint not far from it. But you can see that the main motto is we made our mind. Her son is Russia. And you see how this series and 
And also during the occupation, the billboards. The billboards were also one of the gestures uh, that was done to the billboards. People were trying to do something to them. You see that they are all smeared in paint. This one is also smeared in paint and different colors of paint. Uh, this is how people were resisting it. Uh, I'm going to go through them, show them. And after her songs, elaborations, the billboards, uh, became the element uh, that allowed people to vent their negative emotions. People were tearing them apart, burning them. And there was even an exhibition of these billboards uh, uh, in Kiev, in the Museum of Ukraine in World War II. And this is how you could see them spread out on the hills, the billboards from her son. And one of the first actions of the Ukrainian government that came back to her son is that those old billboards were substituted with the new ones, the patriotic ones. And the one that you could really see stand out who said that uh, you're our people, you're free. And regarding the conclusions of my research, I have five more minutes. I'd like to say that focus on her son as an oblast center is for a reason, because you know that it was the only oblast center that Russians managed to take over during the full-scale invasion. But it was emphasized all the time that her son is the only city that was taken over that used to be the center of a province back in the day so it, it was related to the greek project by the russian empire that was implemented on these territories back in the 18th century it was highlighted in every way possible for the information consumer in russia also one one more conclusion is that the ads that you could see in the city became a very clear part and parcel of the russian propaganda campaign and if the first time they did it was dedicated to the victory day, it looked more like a decorative thing to do. But uh, there was the second uh, step of putting up the ads. The decision about annexation was made pretty late, which was the end of the May. Basically, they started pushing this policy through in summer. And all of the visual images during that campaign either included well-known um, people from history or they were using some anonymous images. There were, one of the peculiarities is that there were no well-known people of authority who decided to collaborate with the occupiers. And you know, oftentimes people will say that Saldo became the head of administration, but it is a person who lost at the local elections twice, and he has a very negative image in her son. He is considered to be a thief. And, you know, people were even saying back in the day, how could you put him in any position? He's a thief. So this anonymity This anonymity of the present day demonstrates a very low level of support coming from the local population. So it demonstrates what were the challenges that the occupiers came across in the occupied territory, the lack of collaborators. Distorted perception of the situation in Ukraine that resulted from the messages in Russia during the last 20 years. The majority of campaigns mentioned people from monarchy, different statesmen, and different historic events. At the same time, the use to imagery was very limited. They mainly focused on the 18th century.
почали щось не те робитися в Україні. Even though I understand that it was 2014 when bad things started happening, judging from the billboard. There were five billboards dedicated to Potomkin alone. The overall narrative analysis, we look at the series of these billboards at the one whole narrative. The narrative of using memory used a certain model of the marketing funnel. First, people were demonstrated a large amount of the founding fathers, quote unquote, uh, of the imperial period. And then some ad hoc facts from the Soviet days, heroic Soviet days, then a pinch uh, of the tragedy of for the Ukrainian nation and her son, the economic drop, etc. And also trying to show that the future is going to be much better. That is why consumers had to do the right choice, go to the referendum and vote for joining the Russian Federation. The information campaign was supposed to result in institutionalization of new members of society. Basically, her son residents seeing themselves as part of the Russian people, but this didn't happen because on the narrative level of a um, normal person, all of the characters uh, that were used during this ad campaign and the collaborator that were used during this information campaign were anonymous or unpopular, not that well known, which means that the efficiency of the narrative uh, of an ordinary person depends on such a thing as an anonymity of a certain character or hero or the contrary. And we can say that the chronology of the memory in her, the occupied her son included the following main elements. Retrospective ties with the artificially picked timeline in history and pragmatic future. And these two components are the most widespread models in election campaigns. Retrospective voting, meaning for the past achievements. And it was offered to the people of her soul to vote for the achievements from 200 years ago. Or the prospective vote for the promises, promises that will come true in the future. And the uncomfortable present day does not have its own spot in this scheme. Thank you so much. I managed to do that within half an hour, as it was uh, mentioned by Mr. Illa in his email. Thank you so much, Mercola. As always, it was an unbelievably interesting presentation, very interesting presentation uh, that you shared with us. And I see that colleagues are ready to start a discussion and ask their questions. Go ahead. I don't know which one of you was the first. So maybe, Serhii, you go first and then Janusz. But I think Janusz was first to raise his hand. Thank you, thank you. Then Janusz, you go ahead. Okay. Um, no, I, uh, you can go first, Serhii. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mikola, for such an interesting presentation, for so many pictures, uh, for your analysis. I have a few questions. Question number one, when we're talking about instrumentalization of the memory, we have to also keep in mind uh, the actors of memory, the actors of the memory policy. On one of the billboards that were demonstrated by you, I, I could see, if I'm not mistaken, the logo of United Russia, but it was not featured on other billboards. Well, of course, it is an instrumentalization of the memory in such a campaign with a very systemic. It was, so to say, uh, systemized and it was happening stage by stage. But who was the main actor? Who was the generator of these ideas? Was it the Kremlin? Was it the curators of your city from Russia? Or maybe it was a locally initiated thing. Maybe some local collaborators, even though you said they are not well known, they are not popular, but maybe they're trying to be creative. So do you know, so to say, the institutionalization aspect of this information campaign, who 
was the creative mastermind behind it. Who was doing that? Was there someone as in uh, Donetsk, where there was someone mastermind at the central level with some people helping at the local level or maybe in a different way? This was the first question about the actors. The second question is, at the beginning, you have mentioned that the occupiers failed to monopolize uh, the digital domain, the social networks, uh, and uh, this propaganda was uh, largely limited with the outside city ads. But you have also mentioned that the majority of Kherson residents uh, obtained information from pro-Ukrainian sources uh, on social media, on Viber, on Telegram. Could you please somehow verify it? How did you define that the majority of Kherson residents uh, obtained their information from the patriotic sources? I'm talking about information about uh, everyday life and everyday information. So what is that statement based off? Well, clearly there could be no monopolization, but you said the majority did. So I would like to find out more about how did you infer about this majority? And my third question, well, I'm just now brooding around. Should we call all series that were demonstrated by you a political advertisement. Well, I don't know. It's just my impression. I'm just sharing my opinion. Well, at least this series uh, about agricultural equipment, uh, about money paid during the um, pregnancy leave, uh, maternity leave, uh, this is an analogy to a social ad, in my opinion. Of course, it clearly impacts your political behavior, but this is not a classical political ad. Also, non-classical political ad also could cover this historical references that are not encouraging you to vote for someone. Yeah, they mentioned Potomkin, etc. Maybe it should be identified as social ad, even though I understand that it boils down to terminology. Thank you. So these are three questions from me. Okay, I'll start from the last one. In my opinion, this is a classical political ad. If you look at it, as I have mentioned, as the only narrative that started in late May, and it was a series, this was a series of one political campaign. The last time when they posted it, it was dedicated to the referendum, to the political event. And this series with tractors, et cetera, had its logics too. You know, they were talking about the payments uh, during the maternity leave, uh, uh, the um, you know, pensions, uh, the passport of the Russian citizens, uh, which would guarantee social well-being and welfare. It also ended with the political type of the message. So I think that this is a political advertisement. Regarding the second question, yes, it is a very simple method. I was uh, simply following the number of people that were subscribed to a story on Telegram channel, you could compare how many people subscribed uh, to Kherson military administration that was run by the occupiers or bloggers, uh, occupational such as Stremosov. Well, the maximum would be 10K subscribers. While if you check pro-Ukrainian Telegram channels, the local ones, uh, such as Kavun City, Watermelon City, or Konstantin Rajenko, a journalist. They had 10 times more. I even have an article dedicated to it separately. If you want, I can share it with you so that you can dive deeper into this topic. And there you can see the comparison of the subscribers' numbers. If you compare the occupational powers on the uh, Telegram channel and pro-Ukrainian. And the first question, which one was it? Could you remind me? Well, 
I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's hard to find out. But who were the people who ordered it? Oh, who ordered it? Okay, I have, I have the response. Maybe it was Kremlin or whatsoever. Yeah, I also mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. It is obvious uh, that the actor of this campaign was a person outside of Ukraine, not even from her son, but outside of Ukraine in general, because uh, there were lots of flaws because they turned that into a person from her son, even though he never came here. They also said that Pushkin is from her son even though no one has ever confirmed that he actually even stayed in her son. Such people as uh, Gorbatov, uh, Boris uh, Gorbatov, an author of the essay title, Her Son, it describes the time of the war. As a researcher, I am aware of who he is, but most people don't know anything. Denis Davidov, well, he does have something to do. He came here with his father, but he never was, uh, a, so to say, local, a person from local history. Patonkin and Suvorov, yes, of course. This is a part, uh, this is what the guides tell you about, but they don't never mention Davidov. So, as I said, the source of these texts on the billboards, uh, this is copy-pasted from Russian websites. So, I have only, I think, well, looking at how it all was happening, there were at least two brigades of Russian political analysts, at least two, maybe even three, because everything was repetitive. They hired people and they were like, oh, Potemkin, her son equals Potemkin. That's the day series. These were fired because they felt, well, I'm just imagining things now. And then the other group came and they had the same idea. So they do not understand the context. Nobody did any research. And the repetition of the series shows that this person is not from here and this person changed and they were doing this campaign in a pretty conventional way, in a pretty standard way. So on the one hand, Harrison intellectual elites did not support occupation and they were not even asked. No one tried to engage them. I know that uh, uh, one local historian was arrested, but if uh, he was engaged, even though obviously he was pro-Ukrainian, he probably would have told them that, well, Denis Davidov uh, are not going to convince people in her, so they don't know who that is. He probably is... Uh, uh, associated with uh, rather than a hero who will push a person from her son to vote the way the political analysts uh, would like them to. Thank you, Mikola. Now everything is clear. Thank you so much for responses to my questions. One more thing I'd like to add. It is weird that they didn't use Mr. Harmosh because he's from her son, right? The, the uh, present day actor who's in Russia, Mr. Harmosh. Yes, uh, he supported occupation and they even said, uh, well, I haven't heard any statements come from him, but I, from what I know, he was gonna help uh, the theater, but probably he did not uh, allow to use him and his personality even during this campaign. And this also relates uh, to the title of my presentation, Uncomfortable Present. Even Russians who originate from her son also refused, or for some reason they haven't been engaged to this campaign. So, well, even though they could have found Polunin, they could have used him and Latinina, was also from there in Gmash, but for some reason they didn't. So maybe they thought that it would be too much, or maybe, again, political analysts uh, did not dive deep enough, didn't do their research. So, yeah, it was a very um, uh, simple campaign. They didn't put in enough effort. Thank you very much, Mikola. Janusz, please go ahead. Thank you, Mikola, for your presentation. 
And uh, thank you for your reply to the question. And uh, talking about uh, the figures that have been used, uh, for instance, uh, Nikola Lekarev uh, from uh, Carmelita series, uh, an actor could have been used on those posters. He was born in Kherson. I have the following question. Uh, the uh, invasion into Ukraine lasts for two years now. I am from Kherson and uh, I have seen some of these uh, billboards uh, that you have shown. Russians and Ukrainians are the same nation. We are united, we are together. Those uh, were the narratives at the beginning. But later on, I noticed uh, that uh, they started changing. The topics uh, that uh, were used later on uh, were as follows oh, we as people we love ukrainians but we do not like uh, nazis and we do not like zelensky and now i see that uh, this narrative has changed as well now it is even against uh, the ukrainian people and my question is uh, as follows have you observed the change in the narrative of uh, these billboards uh, throughout two years of war? Have you seen any change in uh, their attitude um, throughout this time? Thank you for your question. Well, I do not have uh, access uh, to the occupied territories now, and all the information that I can get uh, comes from the open sources, uh, the uh, Russian channels and the Russian media sources. Uh, but now I see that there is a lack of interest in uh, this topic, in the topic of Kherson. Now the billboards are mostly about uh, the elections. Uh, the logos that are used are the same. For instance, uh, letter B. And these billboards are posted all over Russia. Sometimes uh, some billboards are related to, to the veterans. Uh, some of them uh, are about uh, the Great Patriotic War. And uh, sometimes we see that uh, there are some parallels uh, drawn uh, between uh, the present day situation and uh, the uh, World War II. But we see that now um, uh, there uh, is no investment uh, into the uh, campaign strategy for the campaign strategies uh, for uh, this uh, type of uh, advertisement uh, for this special military operation. Catherine the uh, second, Dusev Ushakov. Uh, disappeared from public uh, space. Well, in any way, they are not uh, that strongly present as uh, during that uh, political campaign, propaganda campaign on the eve of referendum. Thank you, all clear. Thank you for your response. Mariana, go ahead and then Valerie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was so fascinating. And I apologize. I apologize if there any noise, uh, my dog might be barking. Makala, your observations uh, could uh, be used as an accusation in terms of the explanation of the real purpose of the Russian aggression in Ukraine. In general, it looks like uh, when we are talking about advertising, it is more about uh, advertising offering something to be bought, um, something on sale. But what is offered by this ideology, by this Russian propaganda machine? This is uh, the empire project, uh, the project of uh, the empire past, not even the future. What are your plans uh, for the future? Are you going to look uh, at uh, this topic from a different uh, perspective? Uh, 
Luckily, her son is deoccupied. Uh, hopefully, it re remain Ukrainian for good. But uh, I see that um, the occupiers have no intention of uh, developing uh, and uh, st stimulating growth on the occupied territories. I think that uh, this information could be used uh, for the explanation to the Western audience uh, that uh, the occupation is uh, the um, empire objective. It doesn't have any objective of uh, improving the quality of life uh, in uh, those occupied territories. This is what the special military operation is about. Well, my presentation is covering uh, the time frame of the 2022. The situation is changing on the occupied territories. Recently, I was able to interview some people who have left uh, occupied territories. And uh, I am also interested in monuments. And I see that on one hand, uh, the monuments uh, to Holonomore, to artificial famine, are being destroyed in the occupied territories. And on the other hand, uh, they are reconstructing and uh, retrofitting uh, the monuments uh, to Shevchenko. And uh, they are doing that uh, with uh, TV cameras being on the spot, on the site, as if showing uh, that uh, there is freedom over there and uh, Shevchenko is allowed. In 2022, the Empire Project was predominant, the Empire Project and also the Soviet Project. My uh, first uh, presentation in uh, this uh, fellowship program was dedicated to the monuments. And uh, the, the main indicators uh, of uh, the uh, Russians in the occupied territory, uh, those were the flags, uh, the, uh, the flag with the coat of arms of uh, the victory, and the other one uh, with uh, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, but it was the coat of arms of uh, the Russian Empire, but the uh, the banner of victory was used. But uh, the Russian flag, uh, the uh, typical uh, tricolor flag, uh, was not used. It was hard to find, and even Russian patriots uh, were questioning this situation. We are trying to recreate Russia. We are not trying to recreate uh, the Russian Empire. And I think that that became the turning point in uh, the propaganda's uh, views. They didn't uh, completely step away from uh, the empire narrative. It is still there on the background. But now they are mostly focused on the uh, extension of the borders of the Russian Federation. The empire flag uh, has uh, not been used uh, that frequently last year. But in 2022, it was uh, the first flag uh, to be installed uh, on the administrative building in Kherson when the occupiers came. Then uh, they put on the Soviet flag, and only after those two flags, they put on the Russian tricolor flag. Thank you, Mikola. Uh, Valerie, if you don't mind, I also have a question, which is a follow-up. Mikola, do you think uh, that uh, this uh, reconstruction of uh, the uh, Shevchenko monument uh, uh, is part of uh, the uh, Russian tradition and is part of the attempt of uh, fitting Shevchenko into the Russian narrative, as uh, Shevchenko used to write in the Russian language as well. 
Right. I believe that uh, the Russian narrative uh, is part of uh, the Russian uh, propaganda and uh, Shevchenko is part of uh, the Russian approach uh, to the local history. The same pertains uh, to Bogdan Khmelnytsky and uh, uh, the date uh, of uh, signing a Periaslav agreement, uh, the 3rd of January. The monuments uh, to Khmelnytsky uh, also have flowers and uh, there were some uh, ceremonies uh, for laying flowers to those monuments. The same pertains to Shevchenko. They are trying uh, to incorporate Shevchenko into that narrative. I haven't heard about uh, Shev Shevchenko monuments uh, being destroyed in occupied territories, neither in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. Uh, maybe my colleagues could tell us more because I was not following closely the situation with those monuments uh, in uh, those uh, um, People's Republics. I can add on that. Actually, they are not destroyed and uh, they are protected. In uh, Mariupol, for instance, uh, where there was uh, the drama theater destroyed, uh, the temporary a tent uh, that is uh, covering uh, the construction site uh, contains uh, the portrait of uh, Shevchenko. Shevchenko is uh, uh, viewed uh, from the Soviet perspective. Uh, he is viewed as a culture icon uh, that uh, was used also in the Soviet times. And they are trying to get back to those uh, culture items uh, from Ukrainian history who have been legitimate during the Soviet times. Thank you, dear colleagues. Valery, go ahead. Valery. I'm sorry, there is a very strong echo when you talk. The Soviet narrative, uh, the narratives that were widespread during the Soviet times, uh, Shevchenko, Khmelnytsky, um, these narratives prevail even today. Valery, I'm sorry, I think maybe you have uh, your phone and your laptop switched on at the same time, and that is why we hear an echo. Could you do something about that? Oh, I can add. Maybe this is what Valery intended. Even in the 19th century, Ukraine was not a homogeneous country. There was the Ukrainian movement that was in favor of the Russian Empire, and there was the publication that was called For the Faith of for a cup czar and uh, for czar. And it, in this publication is used uh, also in Russian propaganda, among uh, other means. Let me give it another try. Can you hear me better now? No, I'm sorry. We cannot hear you well. There is an echo. Svetlana, your microphone is off. Thank you. I was trying to prompt Valeri to type uh, the question into the chat box. Well, unfortunately, we cannot hear you well. All right, dear colleagues, uh, anyone else uh, who wants to share or to ask uh, a question? We still have uh, some minutes left. I had a question about uh, the situation with the languages uh, in Kherson. I have noticed that all these billboards were in uh, Russian. 
Were there any billboards in the Ukrainian language? What was the attitude to the Ukrainian language? Do you know anything about that? While uh, Russia is uh, treating uh, the um, ethnical minorities in the occupied territories uh, in the same way they treat the ethnical minorities uh, in other occupied territories. Uh, for instance, in uh, uh, Crimea and in Kherson region, uh, the uh, official languages uh, were three. Um, Russian, Ukrainian, and Crimean Tatar. And of course, you uh, do not uh, have to uh, choose uh, Russian as uh, the language of uh, study for your children. Uh, but in order to refuse uh, from the Russian language, you have uh, to write uh, an official request and reject the Russian language. And of course, no one would do that. In Crimean Tartar language, the way it is taught, uh, it is taught in Cyrillic. So you know that uh, in um, Ukraine, uh, Crimean Tatar is uh, using uh, Cyrillic, is using, sorry, Latin alphabet, uh, while in the occupied territories, uh, they are using uh, Cyrillic alphabet. Of course, um, there is uh, Russification over there, and the uh, Ukrainian language doesn't have any space in uh, the occupied territories. Thank you. It is all clear. We have some time for a quick question. Nadia, please go ahead. Just a quick question. Mikola, thank you very much for your presentation. My question is as follows. From all those billboards, uh, from all those uh, short messages and long messages, uh, they are trying to show something positive. Uh, the great events of the past, some promises of a bright future, economic uh, growth. Were there any political ads uh, that uh, had some negative messages, uh, for instance, anti-Ukrainian, anti-American? Let me show you this only billboard that, that was dedicated uh, to a different narrative. I actually clicked through it, uh, but I want to show it to you now. Just a second. This is the only billboard. I'm sorry, Mikala, we cannot see your photo. No, no, we did not see anything. That is strange. Just a second. Well, I will describe it to you. It was um, a, a billboard from the series Kherson, um, the city with uh, Russian history. And there was a billboard that says uh, that in uh, 2014, uh, the city of Kherson lost uh, 50 percent of its economy due to the blockade of uh, Crimea by uh, the Ukrainian authorities. So that was uh, the only message that pertained to, to the present days. There were no anti-American messages. I haven't mentioned uh, that, uh, um, but uh, apart from the billboards, uh, occupiers uh, were also using printed press. They were printing newspapers. Of course, they were not very popular but in order to compensate uh, for the uh, Ukrainian dominance in uh, the um, media environment, uh, they were printing uh, the newspapers. For instance, uh, the truth of uh, on our region, Nadnipravska Pravda, um, they were about uh, 15 issues of this newspaper. And it was uh, dedicated to, to uh, Anglo-Saxon conspiracy theories. Uh, and, but um, it never, these narratives never made it to the billboards. Thank you so much, Mikola. Janusz, go ahead. 
I wanted to add a little bit because I also come from the occupied territory. Regarding your question, it was not the billboards, uh, but rather the brochures. Uh, I think uh, they were mentioning uh, the elections of the health lighter or something of that type. And it said homosexuality is a threat to the society. Satanism is a threat to the society. So this was the election by Saldo. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, esteemed colleagues. Thank you so much, Mikola, for such a uh, substantial presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. As always, you have very interesting presentations, and we're really glad that you have joined us, and we had such a lively discussion, lively, substantial discussion. I was also taking notes when the colleagues were making comments, because I'm still working on the final version of the paper. So well, definitely take into account. Amazing. Uh, Valery? Uh, make sure that you check what happened with your device. Okay. Without further ado, I think we can move on to the next presentation. I will start the recording.